for nothing like that to happen again. All right, you can hear me, right? Okay, sounds that's a yes. Okay, so I apologize. Let's keep going. Oh, all right, the Spanish influenza pandemic, 1918. To, oh wait, I gotta start the from current slide. There we go. Spanish influenza. Uh, the Broadmoor Hotel opens in 1918. There had been a hotel there previously, but they went through some changes and they decided to, here I open my chat window, hold on. Sorry, I got all flustered here. Okay, I'm gonna put the chat window back up so that you may ask questions if you have them. So, so someone says, we can't see the slide. Cannot see the slides, your screen isn't being shared. Breathe, okay. Thank you for the breathing. Okay, from current slide. Ah, uh, boogers. Where's the chat window? All right, this is not gonna go down as my finest hour. Clearly, there it is, okay. Share screen. Presentation, share. All right, I see the chat window again from current slide. Participants can now see your application. Okay, well, we've had what? Five months of everything going super smoothly on this. I guess June is busting out all over with some unhappiness. So if you don't see the slides, let me know in the chat window and we will continue. All right, yeehaw. I think it is the moon, I guess, yes. It was, a, it was a good day out. I had a German tour today, so that's what's going on. President Wilson suffered a stroke after a speaking gig engagement in Pueblo, never returned to office. President Wilson was on a speaking tour around the country, did a whistle stop there in Pueblo. He spoke at one of the buildings right down there in the Union Avenue Historic District area, and that was it. So those are just a few things that happened in this decade. Now, in previous presentations, we've gone over sort of the development in the city during this time, and I covered the 30-year period. So even though um, we're doing the teens today, I wanted to show you the development. And these are, by the way, from my colleague Ken Triple's website, Denver Urbanism, if you'd like to explore more fully. So this was last month. You can see sort of where the gray ones are. That's the development that was already there. The red is what was done during this decade. So just watch, watch as we march along. So 19 aughts, the teens, and we're gonna get a big development in the 20s. But as you see, we are marching steadily toward the Northwest, Southeast and South. All right, so that's just some development within this time period so you can see where things are going. There is no Stapleton, there is no Montbello. The extremes, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest would not be filled up for a while. All right, let me go grab my tour. I got it out of the way so I can reboot the internet. All right, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, this picture is taken uh, in the 19 teens. This would have gone in after the Danielson Fisher clock tower that you see there was built in 1911. And for about 40 years, that was the tallest building in Denver. It was the tallest building west of the Mississippi for about three or four years before the Singer skyscraper would be built in Seattle. So we are looking at 17th Street here. That's the one that's moving off in, toward the distance. You can see Union Station barely there in the distance. So this would have been our skyline until we got our first skyscraper in 1954. So most of the buildings that you see in this picture are gone, but the Danielson Fisher clock tower still stands. So one of the things I mentioned in my presentation last month was the oncoming uh, burst that was the progressive era. So if you haven't read about the progressive era in the United States, it, there are a lot of books about it, and it's really interesting reading. People do sort of focus the progressive era in, especially on the 19-teens. That's kind of when a lot of things came to culmination, 
but the progressive era really began in the 1890s, sort of those seeds were planted then, and it would last uh, into the 1920s. So it, there was no one decade where it happened. Also, you should not think that the progressive era really would have seen some great uniformity of vision from people, even the progressives themselves. There were just as many opinions about what should and shouldn't be done among the progressives as there were in those that they were opposing, the gambling or the drinking or the corrupt government machines. So the progressives were moving forward a bit at a time, even as they were arguing with each other, just as really any human institution would. But that being said, the 19 teens really strongly associated with the progressive era. So let's talk a little bit about it. Last month, we talked about Mayor Speer and his triumphant rise into politics. Last month, yes. So here we have on the left-hand side, some of those who thought Mayor Speer was absolutely not a good thing for the city. Here's what it says at the top. We do things to the honest voter. And Mayor Speer has his foot there, as you see, on a woman who bears the uh, banner of honest elections. And we want you to remember that on election day and not vote for him. On the right-hand side, you see the Prohibition Party stabbing the many-armed uh, monster of saloons, political corruption, and all those things. So the vice of the cities were being fought. And in Denver, the progressive era was going strong. One of the things we don't really think about as being sort of the jumping off point for the progressive era was a day that President McKinley really, really didn't like. President McKinley, when he was voted into office, uh, was very much interested in keeping things sort of with the status quo. He was a fan of the monopolies and businesses. He was assassinated September of 1901, I believe it was, there in Buffalo, New York, and he was replaced by his vice president. Theodore Roosevelt was much more interested in shaking things up. So if you had to point to one watershed moment, which is really sort of uh, synthesizing it down a little bit, uh, that would be kind of the moment when President Roosevelt came into office and was allowed to have that moment to shine. Progressives in Colorado did bring significant change. Universal suffrage had already been granted to the women of Colorado in 1893. So they were pushing for those rights to be applied in other states as well. They were targeting corruption in government and saloons. They were also working on other things like public lands, uh, preserving them. There was this idea that the resources of the West were limitless and we began to see that that was not the case. Uh, water resources, uh, lumber, all of this was something we thought, wow, we really need to work to uh, preserve these things. So workers were getting their voices out there, and they were pushing, and in the end, they were able to get a lot of things done. One of the things, President Roosevelt, here it is. <coughs> Excuse me. President Roosevelt said, <coughs> sorry, the Water went down the wrong pipe. And I'm not sick, I got kicked in the throat. Make note, as I say, that only white women got the vote. Oh, that's a very long, that's a very long story. White women got the vote, Native American women, and all these things, those would come a little bit later. So one of the things President Roosevelt said, where's the quote? Okay, the president called for the nation's reformers to quote, uh, focus their movement of agitation to punish the authors of evil wherever they find them in industry or in politics. So President Roosevelt actually said that. And of course, the big movers and shakers in the business world, they heard this and say, were saying, uh oh, might not be a good time for us. And President Roosevelt, of course, was going to be busting some of those monopolies. So it was quite a time. Now, one of the folks we talked about last month in the Denver area in Colorado was Judge Lindsay. So you see him there on the left uh, doing a speech. One of the other folks that we didn't talk about last month was this lady right here, Helen Ring Robinson. She represented, as one person put it, the maternal voice in politics. So she became the state's uh, senator, the first female senator from the state, I believe it was, 
And these were some of the examples of the people who were changing politics, who were out there trying to get things jazzed up and moved along. In general, you tended to have uh, a very white Protestant mindset in the progressive movement. And while they did push for rights for lots of people, they were fighting for lots of different people. In the end, it did tend to be more focused on uh, the whites and the Protestants out there, maybe a little less so all the way down to a lot less so for those who were not of those groups. Uh, reformers did encounter some limits. They weren't able to get everything done. For example, they were able to get an eight hour workday put in in Colorado, so that was a win. On the other hand, the state's government was unwilling to declare the mining industry or the smelting industry as ones that could be limited by some of these elements that the progressives were putting in. And so those retained many of their very punitive work um, applications, which is why we saw strikes in both industries, even into the 1920s and 30s. Okay. So let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. As I said, progressives didn't get everything they wanted, uh, but they did get a lot of things going. And for a while, the 19 teens looked as if they would be uh, a great momentous watershed decade for all these things getting fixed and done. Not that there weren't folks saying, we don't approve of this. As I mentioned last month, there were plenty of people whose jobs were in the gambling dens, drinking dens, dens of prostitution. And so they were not super interested in having these things go away. One of the big movements of the day, of course, revolved around alcohol. Temperance advocates sought to shut down the saloons because they felt that they were a danger to uh, the public. People who were drunk abandoned their families or they died. All of these things were terrible. I particularly like the poster that the ladies are carrying on the right hand side there, booze or boys, you may either protect your booze or you may protect your children. So uh, prohibition regulations concerning saloons and where they were appeared constantly on the ballot in the early 1900s and they saw many wins. So many in fact that in the end Colorado went dry before the federal government did the same. Prohibition passed at the national level in 1920. We went dry January 1st, 1916. One of the things that we don't really hear about in the discussion in prohibition is it's sort of ugly undercurrent. This is something that I actually first heard about from Tom Noel, a Dr. Colorado himself that I uh, was on tour with today. And since then I've done a lot of reading. There was a real, belief that saloons were a place for anti-Americanism. What you had were these immigrants from Poland or immigrants from Spain or Russia or wherever, and they would come in and they would have their saloons in their own language, with their own newspapers, with their own food. And what that did was perpetuate this lack of assimilation into American culture. And if you got rid of the saloons, that catered to the Saxonians or the, the Welsh or whatever it might be, then these people would be forced to integrate into American culture. So there really was a, an ugly undercurrent of anti-immigrant sentiment uh, that was behind this effort for prohibition at the national level. And in fact, if you look at many of the ethnically created uh, drinking halls in Colorado, and you count how many there were before 1916 and how many still existed after prohibition ended in the 30s, it was absolutely a death knell for these ethnically focused places. They just, they did not survive. So in that way, those who were forcing these people or hoping to force these people to become good Americans, uh, it kind of worked. It was super cheeky of them to do so because many of the people who came to the United States were among the most ardently patriotic people out there. There are all of these newspaper articles and quotes and reminiscences of how all of these Germans and Italians came to the Denver area and were absolutely wholeheartedly Americans. They would give away 
uh, free food. This one place, this Italian guy, he gave away free spaghetti on the 4th of July every year. It was a gigantic event. So unfortunately, we lost a lot of our wonderful ethnic diversity in the Prohibition era, even though at the time they were branding this as a fully good thing without any detractions. All right, let me make sure I didn't miss anything on my notes from, from the progressive era. Now, as I said, by no means is this exhaustive. There are a lot of things that went off in the progressive era that happened that I'm not talking on tonight. This would really be too much for us to talk about if I just did the progressive era. I could do that the whole night. So as a person who likes wild places, uh, I thought I would also talk about some of the other things that are uh, from this decade. So one of them was the creation, as I mentioned earlier, of the National Park Service. And here in Colorado, we were trying to get more of our forests and other resources set aside for permanent preservation. Again, this illusion of the Wild West as being limitless, boundless, uh, we were rapidly losing sight of that. So in Colorado, the folks with the progressive movement were actually trying to work to set these aside. They had allies at the federal level. Colorado's progressives uh, had an ally in the fellow that you see there on the left with his very charming mustache, Mr. Gifford Pinchot. If you haven't learned about him, there are multiple books out there. You may learn all about him. Very interesting fellow. I vote for a presentation just on the progressive area. It is so interesting. I actually could do one just on the progressive area because there's a lot that I'm not going over tonight. Diversity, racism, cultural identity, assimilation. Yeah, we, we really could do one just on that. Denver through the decades is going to take me through next year. Maybe we'll have that as a, as a suggestion for one after that. So Gifford Pinchot, if you haven't read about him, again, please do wonderful stories about the man and about his efforts uh, to get this idea of preserving lands into the public consciousness. Fortunately for him, President Roosevelt was an ardent converse, uh, conversationalist, conservationist. And so Pinchot was an ally and was designated uh, to lead these efforts. He helped with the creation of the US Forest Service and the mo modern National Forest Service systems. This started back in 1905. And in the 19 teens, we established the national forests that are in Colorado. So if you look here, this map, which I got from the Forest Service, shows you some of those national grasslands and national forests that were set aside in Colorado. Uh, one of the folks writing at the time said, the lightning rod of federal management enraged those who still envisioned the West as a region where opportunity was synonymous with unrestricted access to resources. There were plenty of people who thought that setting aside all of this land was a crime. You should have unfettered access to all of these things. And don't think we're not still debating this today. We absolutely are, which is why some places might make great national parks, but if you elevate it all the way to that status, its resources are generally completely taken out of the public access. So that's why you have governments fighting over these distinctions and it's still happening. But in the 19 teens, a lot of people in Colorado, I mean, look at that much land, were really upset as it was set aside. You and I perhaps today think that's a great thing because at least you and I get to go to these places and enjoy them without seeing them uh, emptied of all of their resources. All right, so we march along. Those of you who have toured with me or traveled with me before know that I'm a big old softy when it comes to uh, the wee beasties. And so anything that has to do with the animals is one that's going to be very uh, close to my heart. In 1910, I think it was, yes, the Denver Dumb Friends League was established. Now, this was the culmination locally of movements that have been going on at the national level for years. The American Humane Society was created in 1877 and the founders for the organization said, quote, we advocate for animal welfare on a national level using strategies and resources beyond the reach of local and state organizations. 
And what they did is try to spread the word about the ethical treatment of animals. In fact, I believe it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that the moral character of a country may be shown by how it treats its animals. In Denver, believe it or not, it was actually legal to shoot stray dogs, a dog just walking through your yard or down the street, totally fine to shoot it. Uh, the city was not a very friendly place for the wee beasties. So in the early 19 aughts, uh, the efforts began to create something to take care of them. In 1910, a lady, Jean Gower, and her friends got together and they put together, sorry, someone's checking in here. Uh, they put together the Denver Dumb Friends League. It was uh, inspired by a trip that Mrs. Gower had done to England where they found, or where she found, that they already had such institutions formed in England. In England, she saw that it was called the Our Dumb Friends League, dumb for the original meaning back in the day, meaning unable to speak. So when she came back to the United States, she said, we're gonna make one of these in Denver. The original uh, housing of the animals would have been in really any space that they had, people's garages, people's backyards, just any building that they could find, it wouldn't be until, I think it was 1948, yes, wouldn't be actually until 1948 that they would be able to afford to build their own permanent uh, uh, building for the Denver Dumb Friends League. Uh, one of the folks associated with the Denver, Fr Denver Dumb Friends League was actually Margaret Brown, whom we talked about earlier. She was an advocate for animal welfare. The picture that you see in the upper right-hand corner, those are some kittens at the animal shelter where I volunteer. And in the lower right-hand uh, side, you see some pictures from the Long Hopes Donkey Rescue out in Bennett, which if you've never been there, it will absolutely make your day unless you have allergies. So around the metropolitan area, we have lots of organizations that help with the animals. And uh, that all started back in 1910, again, with the creation of the Denver Dumb Friends League. All right, we mentioned this building earlier. This is the wonderful Daniels and Fisher Clock Tower. Now let's look at the picture first on the left-hand side, please. What you see there in uh, the foreground and then moving off toward the upper left, that is what is today the 16th Street Mall. So it's just regular old 16th Street at the time. So the clock tower was built at the corner of the Daniels and Fisher department store or Daniels and Fisher mercantile, if you would prefer. And it was built to serve as the exclamation point at the corner of the department store, basically saying, hey, come here. Most of you already know this, I know, but for those of you who don't, this was built to be a loose copy of a clock tower in Venice, the Campanile there in St. Mark's Square. I've never been, but my parents went and they said, yes, ours does look a lot like the one in Venice with one important distinction, ours here in Denver is bigger. And because we live in the United States, that is essential. So the clock tower that you see there opened in 1911, Mr. Daniels himself did refer to it as his finest erection, and it has been erect for what, 111 years, which is impressive. So there is no such thing as architectural priapism. This building, uh, as you see from the picture on the right-hand side, is no longer attached to the building that it once sort of hawked. The Daniels and Fisher department store was torn down right down at the the beginning of the 1970s, I believe, I think it was 1971 or so, and the clock tower was going to be torn to the ground as well. I am super happy to say that cooler minds prevailed and the clock tower did uh, get saved. One other thing about the clock tower and the department store, there was a seven foot tall bellman, Mr. Sandell, who worked there for many years, his entire career, more than 30 years. He was as famous as the clock tower. There's this great, uh, picture of him holding his arms out like this and there are people on either side completely below his arms because he was that tall. So the clock tower is a little bit of our history that we don't think much about. Again, the tallest building in Denver for just over 30 years. Oh, for those of you who haven't been up to the top, the area behind those arched air, uh, three arches there and behind the clock is rental party space. So if you'd like to have a bachelorette party, bachelor party, 
even a wedding or so, it is party space. Okay, we march along. Where am I? There I am. In 1912, the Colorado Mountain Club was formed. This is an uh, institution that is still with us today. The idea of the Colorado, Colorado Mountain Club was to get people out to enjoy the mountains on one hand. On the other hand, their big push was for the advocacy on behalf of the mountains and forests and lake, lakes since they could not advocate for themselves. They were super interested in preserving the wild places of Colorado and they're still at it today. In preparation for this, uh, this presentation, I did some more reading on the Colorado Mountain Club, found this picture on their website actually. Uh, they're still going strong. So if any of you would like to get out and hike as well as to advocate for the wild places, this might be a place for you to go. So one of the things that they really pushed for was the access to the wild places for all people, including women. So here you see some ladies off enjoying themselves. Another thing that they pushed for, which I think is fascinating and we don't think about as much, prior to Mayor Spears coming into office, there had been some discussions about setting aside some of the mountains for preservation. Mayor Speer actually really started pushing for that. It actually went to the Supreme Court of the United States, whether Denver had the right to annex land that was not conterminous with the city's boundaries. Now today, governments around the country do this all the time. You don't have to touch in order to have another part of your city. I mean, Littleton has this island way over near the Chatfield Arboretum. That does, it, I mean, it's miles from the city of Littleton. But when Denver wanted to annex some of these mountain places to set them aside for our enjoyment as well as for their preservation, it was against the law. Uh, eventually, through Mayor Spears' efforts and the Colorado Mountain Club, we would create this wonderful mountain park system. If you look here on the map, you're going to see some of the pieces of that. All of those are part of the city uh, and county of Denver, even though they do not touch Denver. They're way out there in the ether. Winter Park, good night. Winter Park's way up there. And that is part of the city of Denver. Red Rocks Amphitheater, part of the city of Denver. So the Colorado, Colorado Mountain Club, if you happen to be a member of them or would like to become one, they are owed a debt of thanks for getting all these wonderful things to be preserved. And the preservation of these places is very important. Not all of them are open for public access. Some of these places, the land is set aside because you have very fragile ecosystems, very rare plants, or places where our watershed needs to be kept pristine. All right. Also happening during this decade, you had the largest snowstorm in Denver's history. All right, we've had plenty of big snows, but this was the largest of them all since the city of Denver uh, has existed and we've been keeping records. The blizzard of 1913 started on December 1st and lasted for five days. During that time, 45 inches of snow fell According to eyewitnesses, as well as the newspapers of the time, the snow began on December 1st and everyone thought, oh, easy peasy, but it essentially did not stop snowing for five days. In the history of the Denver streetcar system, which started in the winter of 1871-72 and lasted until 1950, there are only two times when the streetcars in Denver were shut down. One of them was 1912 when we had a flood that damaged the power station and the other one was this snowstorm in 1913. The streetcar companies did have special streetcars for cleaning the snow off of the track, but a few things happened. The streetcar cleaner streetcars could not keep up and more importantly, the people who wanted to who needed to drive the streetcars couldn't get out of their homes, couldn't get downtown because the streetcar stopped or they couldn't get out of their house. So in the end, as you see the picture in the upper left-hand side, the streetcars ground to a halt. At this point, the streetcar company, the Denver Tramway Company, 
said, all workers, every single one of you get out here and we need to shovel these streetcar lines. So here on the right hand side, you see the streetcar workers shoveling, but that did not allow the streetcars to begin working again. Even though you see the track is clear, what ended up happening is the people of Denver finding a path started using the streetcar tracks to get around on foot. So the streetcar company said, uh, stop, you, we're not able to drive because you're in the road. But there were so many people trying to get where they wanted to that even after the workers had shoveled the tracks, the Denver Tramway Company streetcars were still not able to move for many days. So again, largest snowfall in the city of Denver's history, December 1st through 5th, 1913. Okay, another thing that happened during this time period, and I've got a couple of slides to show you here. We talked about this in the presentation on the 1890s, and we have to talk about it again because there was another significant change at Union Station. So the, uh, the central section that you see here in this slide, this was the second Union Station Tower. The first Union Station Tower burned in 1894, and the tower that you see here in this picture was the second one. In 1914, we expanded it outward. Okay, hold on. Okay, we expanded it outward as you see here. So the new 1914 expansion did not have a tower, no clock tower. In the end, they just went with this expansion outward that you see here. So this is the central section, opened in 1914. You see here in this picture that only the central section expanded forward. If you look to the left-hand side, that wing and the one on the other side, which you don't see, those are the original 1880 wings of this building. They only expanded the central section outward. If you look at the rear of the building here on the left-hand side, the rear of the building, you see the central section, the tall piece connected to the wing over there on the left. So this happened in 1914. We needed more space. We had so many trains coming through town. Uh, in the upper picture, you see some, one of the original benches. When they did the redo in the early part of this century, the idea was to keep the original benches, but they found out that the shellac in the benches included asbestos, and they hadn't budgeted to remediate all of those benches, so they only kept two of them. If you look over here, the lower right-hand side, those flower-like symbols around the pillars, not pillars, arches, those are our state flower columbines. And as you see, it just goes on and on and on and on. In 1914, the main sort of decorative style at that time was Beaux-Arts, and it called for an austere, restrained, less colorful style. So that's why the Union Station in St. Louis, Missouri is this amazing orgiastic thing, but our station here in Denver is very, uh, what I would call sort of plain, elegant, but plain. All right, so that happened in 1914. We march along. Okay, this one I hope you all already knew about, and I hope you've all been. Uh, in 1915, we got Rocky Mountain National Park. Very exciting. Now, a few things about the park. Enos Mills is commonly referred to as the father of Rocky Mountain National Park. It is important to remember that such things rarely are done by only one person. Enos Mills was basically the face and the voice of the effort to get this made into a national park. There were lots of people who helped him. They spread the word. They did all kinds of fundraising. Uh, among them was the Colorado Mountain Club and numerous other organizations throughout the state. Enos Mills was just sort of that focal point for the public eye. So. Here we have a picture from the dedication back in 1915. Rocky Mountain National Park was actually supposed to be much larger. The National Park was supposed to stretch from 
what is today I-70 all the way to the Wyoming border and what is today the uh, I-25 area all the way over to the Continental Divide. That is what they were pushing for. But the mining interests, lumber interests, ranching interests, they yelled foul and it got whittled down, whittled down, whittled down until it got to be the shape it is today. Not that it's not still an amazing park, but it would have been much larger if Enos Mills and his friends had gotten their way. All right, Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a wonderful story. Uh, we had a tour up there a few years ago. Almost all of the park goes unseen because people only go over that road over the top and that's basically all people do. Almost everything else is untrammeled by human footsteps throughout the year. So if you get a backcountry hiking uh, permit or camping permit, that sort of thing, you may go out and be absolutely all alone. Seriously, all alone. Okay. So on the German tour that I did with uh, Tom today, obviously this is something that we talked about very extensively. In Colorado, we had a lot of German immigrants come into the state in the 1850s and 60s. And while they may have been looking for gold or who knows what, in the end that they found, uh, they found that a lot of Denverites, a lot of folks throughout the state had a great thirst for beer. Beer was a dependable way to get your water. Water was a dependable way to get microorganisms and die. So we had a lot of folks uh, work on making beer. Unfortunately, for this very thriving industry in Colorado, as I mentioned earlier, Colorado went dry in 1916. The newspaper that morning ran with the headline, last night was the last night of the world. As you may imagine, they were super upset. Now, a lot of people did run alcohol from Wyoming, et cetera, into the state for those four years until national prohibition was passed. Up here in the upper left-hand side, you see them dumping out some uh, illegal booze that they had found. And over here on the lower right-hand side, you see the sheriff proudly standing with his crew and the alcohol that they have uh, discovered. This particular picture is from many years later, but prohibition did begin in Colorado there in 1916, made a lot of people unhappy. Most of the breweries in the state did not survive. Coors survived by doing malted drinks and sarsaparillas and that sort of thing, and by producing their porcelain. Uh, the Tivoli survived, but others like the Zhang or the Neef, those did not survive uh, prohibition. So put a lot of folks out of business. And looking back now, prohibition's success, super duper questionable. There are numerous authorities out there that believe that that the rise of organized crime in the United States really may be seen as a direct result, result, uh, result of prohibition. Okay, another thing that happened in Colorado, right here in Denver in 1916 was a wonderful romantic marriage. There on the left, you see them as they were quite young, upper right-hand side a few years later. This is the uh, Lieutenant Dwight Eisenhower and the beautiful young socialite, the belle of the ball here in Denver, graduate of East High School, Mamie Dowd. The Eisenhowers uh, would end up traveling the world. Uh, Mamie traveled often with her husband from one point of posting to another, not all of them, of course, but she did travel with him a lot. When they were in Denver, Visiting her family, they would often attend services at the chapel that you see in the lower center there. That is the one standing on the Lowry site. The reason that that building still stands when three other temporary houses of worship were torn down is because that's where the Eisenhowers worshiped. As you know, because I know all of you know at least this bit of your presidential history, the Eisenhowers would rise up to the level of the White House and the Eisenhower's frequently came to Denver during those eight years in the presidency, which is how Denver got closest to being uh, the center of the country. During his convalescence in 1955, he stayed at Fitzsimmons and at the Brown Palace Hotel, which is why the Brown today carries the nickname the White House of the West. All right, make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay. Uh, the Emily Griffith Opportunity School opened during this time as well. I'm going to run out of time, unfortunately. 
So Emily Griffith, this is a story I absolutely love. This lady came west and she found out that there were lots of folks in need of education, especially immigrants. She felt that what they needed in part was ESL, English as a second language. She was told to mind her own business, but in the end, when no one else would rise up to help her with it, she opened a school with her sister and some other folks. Uh, opportunity and achievement were the watch phrases of her uh, building. They're still on the door. And I wrote down one of the things she said. I want the age limit for admission lifted and classes so organized that a boy or girl working in a bakery, store, laundry, or any kind of shop who has an hour to spare may come and study at my school so that he or she may learn what it takes to make life more useful. The same goes for older folks. I already have a name for the school. It will be Opportunity. More than 1,400 students came through on opening day. Uh, Emily and her sister would cook so that students would have food. Eventually, an anonymous donor paid to build a cafeteria and to stock it. Uh, her work was so seminal for the area's productivity and for the lives of these people that Emily Griffith is one of the few women uh, honored in stained glass in our Colorado State Capitol. And that's the picture that you see there in the upper left-hand side. So this is a story I could talk a lot about. I could do a full hour just on Emily Griffith. As a former English teacher myself, I absolutely admire her and her work. So another thing that happened during this time period, 1917, the famous William Frederick Cody, AKA Buffalo Bill did die. He was visiting his sister in Denver uh, when he passed away. This started a bit of a war over where the body would go. If you have been up to the museum there on the top of Lookout Mountain, you may have heard the story about the folks there in Cody, Wyoming fighting. They were absolutely certain that the body was supposed to be in Cody, Wyoming, and they were gonna send some troops down to dig it up and take it to Wyoming. Uh, we were not gonna have any of that. We covered the body in two tons of concrete after it was buried, of course, so that it could not be stolen and taken away from us. There are also stories of some shenanigans going on. Uh, Harry Tamman of the Denver Post paying off the bereaved widow so that she would get the body buried on Lookout Mountain as a kind of relic, uh, a place of pilgrimage for folks coming uh, to see the great frontiersman. So Buffalo Bill, 1917. By this time, he had lost control of the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, Bonfees and Tamman of the Denver Post controlled it at that time. Now, for those of you who watched the presentation last month, you know that we were coming to this sad, sad event, and that is the death of my favorite man in all of Colorado history, Mayor Robert Speer. In 1912, Mayor Speer saw that owing to progressive sentiment moving into Denver and changing things, he would not be reelected. He had served from 1904 till 1912. So in 1912, he did not run. So for four years in Denver, we had decent, honest public servants who essentially got absolutely nothing done. So in 1916, they essentially begged for Robert Speer to come back saying, and I quote, better the devil you know who gets things done. Well, with the arrival of the Great War, Mayor Speer, uh, gets into the spirit of the war effort and works himself essentially to death. He declines to take uh, a car to and from his house over at 300 Humboldt Street. He decides he'll take the streetcar or he will walk. Uh, he ends up spending so much time outside walking that he ends up developing double pneumonia and dies in. March of 1918. His uh, last words when his physician said to him, you should try to take it easy. His words, I am under a strain all the time. Even now I feel it. I am trying to make the affairs of the city best conform to the national needs at this time. The doctor went on to say, I wish you would put such thoughts out of your mind for the present and wait until you are stronger. Mayor Spear ended, it is a strain just the same, dying shortly thereafter. Now, 
one of the things that the naysayers had said about Mayor Spear is that as he was building all of these things and funneling money all over the place to build these things, that he was skimming off the top and making himself quite rich. Well, it was discovered after his death that he was actually not a very rich man. For a person of his importance, he only had $45,000. That's it. No, yes, that was more in 1918, but by no means was this man rich. So really put a lot of those people in their place uh, as to their idea of who Robert Spear was. When I was a stay-at-home mom in the 1990s, Emily Griffith had a preschool support group for parents at Steele Elementary. It was a fun way for parents to be able to interact while paid preschool caregivers took care of our children for a couple of hours. Yeah, this is still going on, folks. The Emily Griffith Opportunity School and its associated efforts, they're still out there. This, this name, this legacy is still with us today. So if, if you haven't looked into it, please do. You'll be charmed. I have my phone on so that I'm able to watch the time. Uh, after Mayor Spear died, basically everyone lauded him. If you read the, the accounts of the people at the time, the praise was basically universal, even from some of his former detractors. All of them, when they were faced with losing this giant in our city's history, all of them were able to find things to say about him that they admired, that he had done, that they really thought uh, things were admirable. So even his former foe, Judge Lindsay, was able to bring up something to say about this guy uh, that was positive. So here you have the city auditorium. Today, this building is part of the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. This is the L.A. Calkins Opera House today. Uh, Mayor Spear did lie in state in that building. So there are the crowds outside the building. Here is the casket inside the building. He was there for several days. It took that much time for all of the people to be able to funnel past, to be able to pay their last respects to this giant in Denver's history. Now, on the right-hand side, you see his marker there in Fairmount Cemetery. Uh, by no means was he a saint, absolutely not. He did plenty of things that were iffy, questionable, even by his own admittance during his time. If you want, anytime we see each other, let's talk about Mayor Spear one-on-one. -on -one. I would be happy to do that. That is some fat I would be happy to chew with any of you. Okay, so Mayor Spear, make sure I didn't miss anything here. All right, we march along. Whoa. All right, I've already been talking to you, uh, with you. Maybe that's the better way to say it. We've been having these conversations here for several months. And one of the things that's always very important for me also is water. I like water. So I'm always interested in pointing out how we get our water and how we manage it. Well, we've been talking about that since the very first decade we talked about back in January. Denver residents uh, during this time period voted yes on a new five member Denver uh, Board of Water, which bought out the Denver Union Water Company, which is what had been around before, uh, for 14 million. Yep, 14 million at this time, creating Denver Water. This was in 1918. So at that time, this was a really big deal. They created something that was separate from the voters. Uh, it was separate from city government. This is an entity that could work independently from all of these other agencies for the good of the citizens that they served uh, without being forced into it by this politician or that politician. Uh, as they said, water service was separated from local politics. And in, uh, to this day, Denver Water is a public agency funded by water rates and tap fees and no taxes. So Denver Water 1918, still going strong. Believe it or not, Denver Water, because of its wisdom, has more water available to it now than it did 20 years ago. So if you haven't taken any tours with Denver Water, I'm a big advocate for what they're working on. Uh, you should do so. They do offer tours from time to time. And we're doing one later this year. I don't remember when, hold on a moment. 
Um, we're doing one later this year. Let me look it up. I think maybe September. I have too many tours. Uh, and I just put this one in here for fun. This is where we get our water in the city of Denver. So as you see, most of it comes from the South Platte River watershed. That's the big blue one that you see down there. Uh, September 6th is when that tours. And then the sort of, I'm not even sure what color that is, teal. Uh -huh. One that you see up there, that is uh, what comes uh, from the other side of the Western Slope and some of our more northerly, uh, I guess actually all of it is the South Platte River watershed, but this, they divide it in South and North there. I'm sure that makes some sense, but this is where we get our water. Okay, Civic Center opened in 1919. This is one of Mayor Spears brain, brain children and it opened in 1919. Oh, boogers, it's seven o'clock. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Civic Center Park, ladies and gentlemen, was the culmination of the City Beautiful movement. Actually, I lost some time there because we went offline. I'm going to go for another few minutes. I hope that's all right. Uh, the City Beautiful movement was Mayor Spears' idea for turning Denver into, quote, the Paris of the United States. And Civic Center Park was meant to act as the beating heart of the city, where the cultural and civic institutions would come together to bring us all together and we could mix and mingle and meet. It's hugely important that we still have Civic Center Park, ladies and gentlemen. It was recently recognized as a national historic landmark. Depending on which resource you read, it is one of two, possibly three, again, depending on which resource you read, intact, nationally recognized Civic Center Parks in the United States. Many American cities have these. Most American cities got rid of them as fashion changed in architecture and development. Almost all American cities got rid of them. So we are extraordinarily lucky that we still have this icon of the City Beautiful movement. And it is considered to be the most intact of all of the City Beautiful movement parks in the United States. Most intact. So yay us for still having it. And here's the dedication of the Greek amphitheater in 1919. Other buildings would follow after this point leading on into the 1920s. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, almost done. I know I realize some of you I'm leaking into your seven o'clock television time. Uh, the Ogden Theater opened during this time period. This is something that uh, we don't think much about. We have all of these places, the Fillmore, the Bluebird. The Bluebird opened in 1914. The Ogden opened in 1919. Originally, <laughs> originally, these were places for lectures and presentations. Here, in fact, in the Ogden Theater, Sir Arthur, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle came and gave a lecture. Uh, Harry Houdini, they say he actually spoke here. He did not. He was at a different venue. But we've got huge names that have performed at these venues, uh, which began there in the 19 teens, such as the Ogden. Over time, the Ogden would be converted. It would eventually become a movie theater, and then it would be converted again into what it is today, which is a uh, performance venue. I haven't actually been in this building ever. I've gone to a concert at the Fillmore. I have never been in this building. So one of these days, I need to go in there. We're thinking of doing a tour next year. The Paramount Theater opened in 1930. So that's gonna be coming up in August. We'll talk about that one in August. Okay, so the Ogden Theater opened in 1919. All right, so at this point, uh, we have some time for questions. I did wanna mention some upcoming tours. We still, oh, phlegm, sorry, boogers, pus, there we go. Okay, some upcoming tours where we still need some space, or we need some people to fill them, our Western Slope Winery. For those of you who like wine, come west and get your wine on. We're doing a tour of Longmont. Folks, we're gonna take a tour of a photovoltaic farm, which I am unbelievably excited for because I wanna learn how this works. And we're gonna study James Michener and his work in Denver, or in Colorado, excuse me, with a tour up to Greeley. You see him there on the CSU campus. No, I'm sorry, the UNC campus in Greeley uh, in August. So we've got some tours. These are good to run. We do have enough people to run them, but we could use some more folks so that we make sure uh, we sur survive until next year. All righty, so at this point, 
Do you have any questions? I realize we had a technical blip there at the front. I'm super sorry about that. No clue what happened because I'm plugged directly into the wall here. If you have any questions, uh, give me a shout out here in the chat window and we'll see about getting you all set up. I will be seeing you again next month for the 1920s, a wonderful decade before everything went. All right, so we'll just watch for any questions. If you don't have any questions, have a great night, have a great dinner, all that good stuff. So for those of you who have missed previous presentations, I have them all recorded. All you need to do is shoot me an email and I will give you the link to those that's super duper easy. So I'm gonna put my contact information here into the chat window. Uh, all right, that is my email address. And here is my phone number. Just shout out with any questions, we'll get you all set. Okay, any further questions? I'm singing, singing in the rain in my mind here. Singing in the rain, we need some more rain. I have to go water now. Kevin, we just- All right, Kevin. we're back from the plum room. Hi, Ed, I see you there. Well, we, just, we just got back. Um, I don't see any additional questions coming in, so I guess I'm gonna send you off to your lovely evening, folks. Raindrops keep falling on my rain. No, I'm singing. I, I think uh, singing in the rain in my head. That's the song I was singing. All right, folks, I'll see you again next month for the 1920s. I hope you have a beautiful night. Okay, Stay Kevin. cool. More Take very care, soon. Buddy. Thanks for joining. Bye -bye.